a very important message. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Anchor is an app, and it's free. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify and Apple Podcast and many more platforms. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Now, let's begin the podcast. Hi, welcome to the eighth episode of the Thoughts with Lakshman podcast. Um, In my podcast, I focus on a range of topics from that all relate to German culture. That's the overarching theme of the podcast. I also focus on German history, how it relates to German culture. I, I do talk about individuals, like German philosophers. And yeah, so that's basically the focus of the podcast. Um, this is episode eight of my podcast. And just in case you haven't watched any of my previous episodes, I'm going to quickly mention, give a quick brief on like what the previous episodes were about and just in case just so just in case any of those topics interest you and also um in my podcast each topic is covered in one episode so let's say you're interested in episode four you don't have to watch episode three to like know everything in episode four nothing's related so yeah so in the first episode of my podcast I explored East German nostalgia after the uh, Berlin Wall was taken down. Um, so for those of you that many people know that know about the Berlin Wall and they know that there was East Germany and West Germany. West Germany had the better of it. There was capitalism in West Germany, there's socialism in East Germany and West Germany enjoyed a lot more economic success than East Germany. However, um, even after the wall was taken down, you'd expect all East Germans to be ecstatic, and they were, but one negative to the wall coming down was that certain products like Spreewald pickles, there were some mustards, there were some wines, that these products that survived only because of socialism, and East Germans became very accustomed to them. And they'd almost like felt connected to them because they'd become such a major part of their lives. And these products did not survive the capitalist market. So they soon died out. So although um, the wall coming down was a major positive for East Germans, um, there was a negative to it. And that was the nostalgia or nostalgia for East Germany because of the products. So it's an interesting podcast. It looks at something in a unique way, which I think is cool. I also talk about a movie that kind of explores this um, nostalgia. And yeah, in the second episode of my podcast, I looked at German immigration into the English colonies. Um, In the 18th and 19th centuries, many people don't know this, but other than, of course, English immigrants, German immigrants were actually the largest immigrant group to the English colonies. And Germans were attracted to the English colonies because the colonies for the first, well, the first colony was established in Jamestown in 1608. And around 1624, the Massachusetts Bay Colony was established. And around 1640, 1650, you'd you'd see the first immigrants coming into the to the English colonies. And the reason why was that the colonies had built up a reputation for having political freedom, economic opportunity, and those were two very attractive attributes to many immigrants. Um, and not many countries at the time enjoyed those things. Sure, there's economic opportunity in many countries, but political freedom was not a common thing you know democracy was not really and it wasn't a full democracy but you could still elect officials there was a representative assembly so that was very attractive to many germans 
And after the failed democratic revolutions in Germany, um, it prompted many Germans to immigrate into the English colonies. The third episode of my podcast, I focus on a, a topic that, a concept that originated from these German immigrants. So kindergarten. Kindergarten is actually a German word. It's not like an English word that's translated from German. It's exactly the German word. Kinder means children. Die Kinder means children. And Garten means like an organized lecture. And what happened was when the German immigrants immigrated into the English colonies, they also, they stayed right together. They had their own communities and they stayed right next to each other. And they would send their kids to school at a very young age, much younger than um, other English colonists would if they did even send their kids to school. Because at the time, school in the colonies, and I guess you could say across Europe, school existed to educate the next generation of ministers, of religious leaders. So for families that weren't very religious, they saw no point in sending their children to school. And their children would just work. And Germans, on the other hand, they saw the value in it. And they would send their kids to school at a very young age. And many colonists thought that it was really unusual. But when they saw the success of these German kids and how smart they were, and Germans believed that it was very important to stimulate the brain learning at a young age. So when the success of this concept of kindergarten was seen by other colonists, it became, you know, it spread and it expanded and ultimately it led to kindergarten becoming a thing. It's developed over time, but today we have kindergarten and we can credit it to the Germans. Um, yeah, so in the fifth episode of my podcast, um, or not the fourth, I just talked about the third. So in the fourth episode of my podcast, I discussed the role of soccer in uh, German culture. Um, For those of you that don't know, Germany is one of the world's soccer powers. They recently won the World Cup in 2014. Um, They have one of the most watched domestic leagues, and they have some of the most recognizable players in the world. So I, I did talk a bit about the soccer part of soccer in Germany, but I also focused on how culturally it brings together so many people, regardless of where you're from in Germany, how you look, Many, many Germans share a passion for soccer, and they feel proud of their national team um, having so much success. It's a nationalistic, there's a nationalistic element to it too. And um, for example, with the Super Bowl, nearly 99 million Americans watched the Super Bowl last year. And that's been a number that's rising, but it's not rising by that much. And that's less than one third of all Americans because the population of the US is around 327 million. In Germany for the World Cup final, 87% of Germans watched, which is crazy if you think about it. Because the Super Bowl is such a massive deal in the US and only like less than one third of Americans watched it. In Germany, 87% of Germans watched the World Cup final when Germany was in it. 83% of Germans watched the World Cup semifinal too. So it, I thought that stat was really interesting because it really, through that comparison, you can understand just how significant, how crucial soccer is to German culture. In the fifth episode of my podcast, um, I looked at another German philosopher, Karl Marx. Marx is probably the best known German philosopher in history. He's known for Marxism, which is his socialist economic policies. Um, He explored his, Marx really was the, he was one of the first people to really expose socialist ideas in a, in a really like attractive way. And Marx, what he, he published his work and he was very, um, He was a very good writer, and Marx spent, basically, and it's interesting because what I did in my podcast is I focused on how his early life influenced his later life and and his policies, because Marx actually grew up relatively affluent. It wasn't like he grew up poor. 
That's why he believed in socialism. He grew up affluent. He went to a proper school, which was went to a very nice school, which was rare at the time. He received a proper education, but Marx really he spent a lot of time, and some of his best friends were factory workers, and that really, you know, influenced his beliefs that workers should control the means of production, not owners. And I also looked at the impact of Marx's ideas on the Russian Revolution. You could even argue today in politics um, across the world and in the U.S. Um, so yeah, Karl Marx was the center of the fifth episode of my podcast. In the sixth episode of my podcast, I did something a little different. I focused on the German Bundesliga. I discussed some of the major stories currently in the Bundesliga. Along with the current financial situation with COVID,、um, yeah, and possible transfer activity we could see in the summer. But yeah,、um, in the seventh episode of my podcast, I focused on Immanuel Kant, his policy, his philosophies. He's another German philosopher, and I broke them down. So Kant is most famous for his book. What's、well, not really? It's a book. But it's really a really long, well-developed essay that's eight hundred sixty-two pages, and Kant dis- discusses the topic of rationalism versus empiricism, and Kant really focuses on rational thinking, like thinking using logic, versus、um, believing things or. You know, formulating ideas because of experiences, and Kant argues that rationalism is hardly ever wrong, while empiricism can be wrong. Empiricism is using experiences, and Kant argues against the existence of God. He argues against things like that.、Um, it's an interesting book. It's very deep. That's what. But it's one of the most significant books in Western、uh, philosophy. So yeah, it's an interesting book.、Um, and Immanuel Kant—it's also spelled with an I, by the way. Many people don't know that I, I for Immanuel.、Um, he is one of the most well-known Western philosophers. And I'm probably going to do podcasts in the future that explore、um, other philosophers who created their. F- Theories based upon his ideas, and might talk about maybe four or five philosophers that were influenced by Immanuel Kant because he is so significant. And there's a tree of philosophers. You could say the same thing with Karl Marx. There's a tree of people who believe the same things.、And、I want to focus on that in an episode of my podcast, just so that the influence of these two men is really clear.、Um, But yeah, this is the、uh, eighth episode of my podcast.、Um, if any of those topics interest you, I highly encourage you to take a listen. Remember that my podcast is not in a particular order, so you can、uh, jump around, watch whatever, listen to whatever one that interests you. But yeah, let's get into this episode of my podcast. We're gonna be focusing on religion in German culture, the role it plays, and how it has evolved over time. So the Reformation initiated by Martin Luther in fifteen seventeen. It was Martin. Now this was interesting because it basically separated Protestants, and the way it separated Protestants, it created like a new branch,、um, and it divided German Christians between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism, and. It introduced the well. This is kind of related to it, the Peace of Augsburg. It introduced the principle that, generally speaking, the inhabitants of each of Germany's numerous territories should follow the the religion of the ruler. So, for example, if the South and the, and the West were ruled by a Catholic leader, then the South and the West should be Catholic. And the north and east, and the north and the east, ruled by Protestant, which is what happened. The north and the east were ruled by Protestant. The west and 
and the South were ruled by Catholic, everyone else should follow the same religion as their ruler. Now, this religious affiliation had a significant effect, not only like, I guess you could say subjective factors, like culture, personal attitudes, but also social and economic developments. Like the willingness of Berlin to receive Calvinist and Calvinist is um, related to the Reformation. So the willingness of Berlin to receive Calvinist Huguenots from France meant that by the end of the 17th century, about one fifth of the city's inhabitants were from France. And these French Huguenots were basically French Protestants. They, they kind of introduced numerous, numerous new branches of manufacturing to the city. They strongly influenced administration, the army, the advancement of science, education, and fashion. And, um, that there were significant improvements. The Huguenots really helped Germany. Um, and the Berlin dialect still has today many terms that are derived from French. So it's an interesting thing that you can compare it from the past, but you can then fast forward a few years after world war two, many Protestants came into Western Germany and before these Protestants came into Western Germany, the number of Protestants and Catholics in Germany was, there are more Catholics. But now because of these new Protestants that came into Western Germany after World War II, it evened out. And in, and in Germany, similar to the English colonies in a way, churches were supported by taxpayer dollars. So in West Germany, regardless of whether people attended or they didn't attend church, that most people agreed to pay the church tax along with their income tax and tax has been used to support community centers, hospitals, senior citizen centers, group homes, the construction of church buildings. Um, I mean, you could even say that the centrality of religion in Germany has meant that religious leaders, especially, you know, the Roman Catholic hierarchy, they sometimes exercise considerable influence on political decisions and social issues such as abortion. Um, for example, in East Germany, Protestants outnumbered Roman Catholics about seven to one. And although the constitutionally normally guaranteed religious freedom, religious affiliation was discouraged. Church, church membership, especially for like individuals who are not members of the social socialist unity party, which was the ruling party at the time, it was almost like a barrier to career advancement. So you couldn't really progress if you weren't aligned with your beliefs, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. You have to believe a certain thing in order for you to succeed almost. And similarly, youth who were on religious grounds and did not join the free German youth movement, they lost access to recreational facilities and organized holidays, and they found it very difficult if not impossible to secure admission to universities. And um, yeah, so it's, it's really um, interesting how, how far an effort was made to make sure that everyone was on board. They basically took things away from you. If you did not believe in the same things, you are not religious, which is very interesting. Um, Normally, church affiliation was relatively low. Formal church affiliation, about half the population um, in East Germany, compared to like the nearly seven eighths of the population in West Germany that was affiliated with the church. However, you could say that Protestant um, churches acted as rallying points for supporters of unofficial protest groups, and it left demonstrations that toppled the communist government in 1989. So the, 
the religious gatherings, the religious protests influenced the crumbling of the communist government in 1989 in East Germany. Um, Lutherans and Roman Catholics in Germany today are about equal in number. Um, small percentages of Germans are, belong to what are known as the free churches, you know, evangelical Methodists, Calvinists, old Catholics, Eastern Orthodox. The number of people professing no religion is sharply increased and that represents about one fifth of all Germans. And you could also say that because of large scale immigration from Turkey, the Middle East, North Africa, Muslims now account for 5% of the population. Only a few thousand German Jews survived the Holocaust. During the 1990s, however, you could say that Germany's Jewish population quadrupled. And it's a really a result of the significant immigration from Eastern Europe. Um, there are now about 100,000 Jews in Germany. And Berlin, as Germany's largest concentration of Jews, has experienced a modest rebirth of its once thriving Jewish community before the Holocaust. And now it's starting to regain um, regain some numbers. Um, but yeah, you could, so just the chart that I have with the population breakdown. So 29% of Germans are Roman Catholics. 37.7 um, are other, um, which also includes people that are not religious. So it's not religious in other, other religions. 2% um, are Orthodox Christians. 4.4% are Muslims and 27% are Pro Protestants. So really you, you've got a 27, 29 breakdown between Protestants and Roman Catholics. Um, and it's similar to other countries. It's a, it's a even breakdown, but there are a lot of similarities between German religion his, and history compared to the U.S. in terms of in the New England colonies and New England states in the 18th and 19th century, taxpayers paid, they funded uh, the church. And they emphasized church involvement. They almost forced upon church involvement, similar to how the Germans did, right? Because as I said earlier, if you were a kid that were not Part of, you were not part of the uh, free religious movement, then it would be impossible for you to gain admission to any college, let alone selective colleges. Um, and similarly, in New England, if you were not part of the church, the Protestant church, you could not vote for many years. So that's a major similarity you could see between the two. Um, other than that, um, yeah, it just it brings us to the end of today's podcast. I hope you enjoyed. Um, it, today we explored religion and German culture. I hope you have a better understanding of the history behind it in terms of Jews, in terms of Protestants with the um, with Calvinism in the 1600s, how it developed with Roman Catholics, how religion nature of religious leaders because of the importance of religion influence political decisions, um, the impact of French Huguenots on the development of Berlin, um, differences in religion between West Germany and East Germany, um, East Germany of more Protestants, West Germany more Roman Catholics. Um, but yeah, and also lastly, the, uh, the almost forced upon support for a religion or belief and for a religion but yeah thank you for listening to the podcast today i hope you enjoy and goodbye